Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending the second of our three workshops on understanding by design by Grant Wiggins and Jay McTighe. In our last session, we talked a lot of, about abstract ideas in terms of what do we want the outcomes for our units to be. What are the learning standards we're hitting? What are those essential questions and enduring understandings we want them to uncover as they go along with that unit? What's the skills and the knowledge we expect from them at the end? And what are, if any, content connections do we have as well? And that is a bit abstract because it's not necessarily in a physical hard copy that we can look at and assess. It's something more along, it requires a lot of reflection, it requires some analysis by teams. But today, we're going to be talking about something concrete, something that is hard copy. We're going to talk about how our assessments can align to our goals from stage one. Hope you're excited. I'm excited. Let's get started. So, I want to put up this slide that we had from last week because it's always good to remember. If we can take all of the understanding by design theory, it can be boiled down into this phrase. The point of education be, can be captured in a single phrase. Worthy accomplishment achieved by causing thoughtful and effective understanding that enables transfer. And our goal as educators is to cause understanding with worthy accomplishment. Now what we talked about last week was how do we frame those end goals? How do we make sure that students understand, they internalize it? Today we're going to be talking about the second part. The idea that we're enabling transfer of our students' knowledge. Now, a couple of objectives before we begin. So I want to give you some very concrete things you will be able to do or you will be able to know at the end of this workshop. First, you're going to understand how transfer is essential essential to mastering a learning standard. And that understanding the characteristics of an authentic performance task allow you, allow students to show transfer of learning goals. You're going to be able to understand how to create effective summative assessments that allow for that transfer. You're going to be able to analyze exemplar summative assessments to determine if transfer is occurring. And you're going to be able to assess existing summative assessments. So I'm going to try my best not to talk at you, and we're going to do, be working with things that you are creating so far in this first quarter of the year. So let's talk about what transfer is, because I've used that term a bunch, and we have to have a common understanding of it. Transfer requires application, real life, real world application. It is not repeating formulas. So one common place that that typically has happened, and it happened a lot for me when I was a student, was in math class. The problems I got at the end of unit assessment were the same practice problems I did in the textbook and were the same practice problems that I did in class. Nothing changed. And to be honest, I was just repeating formula. I didn't understand what the mathematical concept was or how it's applied to the real world. I just knew when the problem looks like this, I do this thing and I get this answer. But there wasn't any transfer. The application has to occur in a new situation. To really be able to determine if students have transferred their understanding, we have to give them something they haven't seen before. Which allows them to think, which of my prior learnings have already occurred? What understandings that I've internalized can be applied to this particular situation to answer that question? Because what that does is it lets students think, okay, I'm not just repeating a formula, I'm not just parroting back information, I'm strategically thinking of what skills and knowledge I have will apply to this situation. And lastly, it requires that learners must apply their learning autonomously. That this isn't necessarily group work. Now, yes, we want them to be able to collaborate. Yes, we want them to work with multiple different groups of people. But if we're trying to assess their understanding, it has to be autonomous. Because typically when we do group work, it either is a regression to the mean, or it's a reflection of the strongest student in the group. We cannot accurately say that that student has demonstrated understanding. So that's what transfer is when I mention that in the rest of the workshop. Now, how we can organize this is through stage two of our understanding by design template. So if you want to hold up that template that you have in front of you, that you got when you came in, it's the blank DVD template. 
It looks just like this. And what I'd like you to do is go to the back of the first page. Go to the back of the first page. And in the middle, you're going to see a section that is titled Performance Tasks. That's where we're going to start. Now again, understanding by design, we are always working toward those end goals in stage one that we created. And we know if students have demonstrated mastery of the learning standards for our unit, ideally by a performance task that is authentic, that is actually a microcosm of what a historian would do, of what an artist would do, uh, what a writer would do, or a reader would do, what a mathematician would do, what a scientist would do. We want them to experience that discipline. It is now no longer sufficient for them to be good at taking tests. I think the one thing that a lot of schools, especially top public schools, are dealing with is all of our students can do well on tests, and they can all play a musical instrument, and they can all speak three languages, but that's not what is going to separate them to go to top universities anymore. What universities want is authentic, long-term immersion in a discipline. They don't care what you know anymore. They want to know what you can do. What can you actually create? And so performance tasks allows not only us to know if they've demonstrated uh, understanding of those learning standards, but we also know that they're working toward being in that discipline. The second thing that we look at in stage two are traditional summative assessments, traditional uh, tests. But again, that really shouldn't be the end goal. Not that we wouldn't have other summative assessments, but the real goal is performance tasks now. And under that, on the second page, you'll see a little section that says formative assessments. So after we design the performance tasks and summative assessments of our unit, we now have to think, okay, so what little formative assessments can I do in class? It doesn't have to be a quiz, although those do work. But what kind of questioning, what kind of activities, what kind of checks for understanding am I going to do in class so that students are confident that they're being prepared for the summative assessments so that we know they've mastered the learning standards? That's how the structure works. That's how stage two is designed. And if you notice on the right, there's a section where you actually note the standard that they're hitting. So we're always thinking about what formative assessment is this preparing them for? What's, uh, what summative assessment is attached to these particular learning standards? We're always thinking how things connect because we want to maximize our time with them. Now, when you design performance tasks, and I'd like you to go back to that section where the performance task is, typically we want to frame it in an acronym called GRASPS. Because again, the goal is we want them to have a real world application so they can transfer their knowledge. And so we think, what is the real world goal? What is the real world role of the student? What role are they being placed in? What is the real world audience of the performance task? What is the real world situation the performance task reflects? What is the real world product for performance and how is it assessed? The one thing you see in almost every single one of those sections is real world, real world, real world. We want them to be prepared for the challenges of 2030 and the real world application of the knowledge. That's why students always ask, why do I need to know this? When are you gonna use this? Let's tell them why they need to know this and when they're going to use this. So hopefully I haven't talked at you for too long. We're going to be working in groups now. Let's actually look at what some of these performance tasks can look like. Now I have about 35 different exemplars for every single discipline you can think of, but I've just pulled out three common ones that we're going to analyze. So I have three performance tasks. I have one that's connected to English, I have one that's connected to math, and I have one that's connected to science and chemistry. Now what the goal is going to be, is I'm going to let you choose which one you want to look at. So we'll have a group for math, a group for science, a group for English. And after you read the performance task, I want you to try and guess what was the learning standard that students are showing mastery of 
through that performance task. So I'm going to put the, excuse me, chemistry ones here, the math ones here, and the English ones here. So we're going to have three groups, use the entire room, read this together, and try to, to determine what was the learning standard for this performance task. Go. Okay, let's start off with the English group. Okay. English group, I want a representative to explain what learning standards you think that performance task is going to hit. Now, before you do that, because the other groups haven't seen your performance task, um, please read it so that everyone can see it and then say what learning standards you think are being assessed there. Okay. The task is, your task is to select an epic hero from the literature we read and write a letter to the hero in which you apply for a job as a crew member in his exposition. In the letter, you must be specific about the position for which you are applying, your qualifications for the home, and a way you feel you would be an asset to the crew. Be sure to make your letter persuasive by making it clear that you understand that particular struggles and adventures that the hero and crew have already undertaken, and how you might be of value to them in handling such situations and difficulties. Right, in business letter form, and include a resume. Um, there's lots of talk about what was going on. We kind of talk about four learning standards. The first is appropriately persuade a chosen audience in writing using evidence. Uh, identify and synthesize essential characteristics of a hero based on reading. Craft a business letter and resume, and reflect and draw connections between a chosen text itself. Now there are a couple ways you can structure this in a UBD. Maybe those four standards are assessed formatively, and then that performance task assesses them summatively. Or you can have a summative assessment, a smaller one for each of those four learning standards, and then that performance task assesses them again. And then if they demonstrate growth from those initial summative assessments, that grade or that uh, proficiency level can be changed because they demonstrate growth over time. Something to think about is that's a very interesting and authentic way to read or write. It's not necessarily an essay. It's something that everyone is going to have to do in their life. Excellent. Let's go to uh, science. Chemistry people, please read out your performance task and what learning standards are being addressed in this one. Chemistry, you are a researcher hired by a group of expert mountain climbers. Hypoxia is the, is the set of symptoms, headache, fatigue, nausea, that comes from a lack of oxygen in body tissues. It is often felt by mountain climbers as they ascend the altitude quickly. Sherpas, longtime residents of high altitudes, seem to feel no hypoxic dis discomfort. Why might that be? Your group wants to know and to benefit from the knowledge. Design a series of experiments that would test the difference in hypoxic symptoms between mountain climbers and Sherpas. Explain, using chemical equilibrium, why high altitude causes hypoxia in the climbers, how can Sherpas avoid these symptoms, how can you test for these possibilities, what would, be a, positive what would a positive test look like, what inherent errors could, would you have to be aware of? <laughs> um, I think we came up with three different um, standards. The first one is straight up um, experimental design, demonstrate how to design an experiment independently. You know, and that can cover many different things and usually is a much longer term assessing constantly during the year. The second one, since you're designing an experiment, um, showing lab skills necessary to carry out an experiment. And then the one related to the chemistry was explain how the body maintains chemical equilibrium. So we're really looking at the, we're 
this, the chemistry part is really the chemical equilibrium about how the body and the outside environment stay in balance. Now, depending on the type of course this is, is we could have a normal chemistry class, an honors chemistry craft class, an AP chemistry class, the level of rigor expected may be different. For instance, in an AP class, that could be a full-on research paper with a research question and a methodology and a lot of important data sets. But in a normal chemistry class, this could be, hey, do a podcast talking about it, or make a YouTube video about it, or make an infographic about it. Allow for some differentiation in terms of that product. But the great thing is that allows for different levels of rigor based on the classes that we have here. Let's go to the math group. So math group, please read out the performance task and what learning standards are being hit here? <clears throat> when contractors give, give us an estimate on home repairs, how can we know if the cost is reasonable? A homeowner has asked you to review a drywalling contractor's proposal to determine whether the homeowner is being overcharged. Students are given room dimensions and cost figures for materials, labor, and a 20% profit. Examine the proposal and write a letter to the homeowner providing your evaluations of the proposal. Be sure your calculations show. Be sure to show your calculations so that the homeowner will understand how you arrived at your conclusion. Uh, we came up with a few goal standards that this could hit because it's a. Uh, it actually covers a lot of things in math and outside of math. Um, but the ones I have are presenting mathematical operations and findings in a professional and clear manner. Uh, the use of mathematical logic to give opinion on real world problems. And applying applied understanding of geometry and rates in real life applications. Okay, fantastic. Now, here's something really interesting. They have to write some kind of report. A lot of times we don't think about discipline specific literacy and math, but in math, you have to write like a mathematician. There are ways to write like a scientist, write like a historian, write like a writer or a reader or a journalist or an artist or a musician. There is dis discipline specific literacy that we often forget about because, because we think about content. But we also have to, if we're training them to be a mathematician, a scientist, a historian, a writer, a reader, a musician, an artist, if we really want them to be prepared for that discipline, they have to learn how to write like that discipline and read like that discipline. So, when students, and when we're designing these performance tasks, which by the way, remember one of the ways you can design stage one in UBDs is actually starting with a great performance task. So if you're not too clear on how to create stage one, but you have a really great authentic idea for a performance task, well then you can do what you just did. Think about what learning standards are assessed and then work your way down in terms of enduring understandings and essential questions. That's the great thing about UBDs. They're not prescriptive. There's not one way to do it. Now in terms of how students can show transfer, they can do it a few ways. And what I'd like you to do is please pick up this handout that everyone should have when they came in. And please go to the back of the first page. So the handout looks like this on the first page. Please go to the back of the first page. So there are six facets of understanding and assessment, six ways that students can show the transfer of their understanding. And what you have in this handout is one, two, three, four, five different disciplines, and how each facet can be shown in that discipline. Literature, social science, mathematics, um, history. So students can explain. This is something we ask them to do a lot. They make connections, they draw inferences, they express themselves, they justify opinions that they have. Students can also interpret. We do this a lot typically in history. What does this mean? Make some sense of it. Analyze what's being said. How does this connect? You, they can also apply and adjust. This is a lot of, used a lot in STEM classes. So now that we've used this, here's this real life situation. Apply it in a unique situation. Go beyond the context to a particular situation at the school. It's the difference between saying, answer these questions about mean, median, and mode, and evaluate our grading policy and make sure it's accurate, right? using a sample set of test data. Other things they can do, perspective. 
We can do this a lot in literature or ethics classes, in music classes, in art classes. Seeing the big picture, considering various points of view, taking a critical stance, avoiding bias. They can also practice empathy, perceive sensitivity, walk in another's shoes, find value in, in other people. Lots of the humanities classes, lots of the arts students do this. And self-knowledge, which really they should be showing in all their classes. That's developing that metacognition and that reflection that allows them to be their own teachers and to take ownership of their own learning process. So I just want you to take a minute and find your discipline on this handout and take a look at what are some examples of each of these facets of understanding in your specific discipline. They would have to interpret information and data, and they'd have to apply it in a new situation. Then once you're able to think about those facets of understanding, so then we could say, so the assessments need to require something like, and think about what they would actually have to do to show this evidence to hit that learning standard or that enduring understanding. And you can see that example on the uh, back of that handout. So now I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit hard. Okay. In your discipline teams. Now again, the arts, you guys do a great job of this. Because you actually do that authentic performance test every single day. It's create this, paint this, draw this, shape this, mold this. Or in music, it's we're doing a performance in front of an audience in two months that we have to get it ready. Arts people, you do this, man. You do this already. You guys do a great job of this. But in our other discipline teams, I want you to take either a learning standard you currently are working on, maybe a standard you're going to be working on later, or it could be an enduring understanding or an essential question that you're currently working on or going to work on. And I want you to try and think about what facets of understanding they may need to demonstrate and what's the evidence that they could show. And what this will do is this will tell you what that performance task can actually look like. So I'm going to give you a while, five, ten minutes. And for just one learning standard, or just one enduring understanding, think about what facets of understanding the student would have to show, and what would that actually look like in an assessment. Go.
So we're going to start off with the history department. So what was your understanding or question? How did that break down to the six fastest understanding? And what evidence would they need to show? Um, okay, so uh, I'm currently working on a unit that is about freedom, and we're talking about um, universal human rights. So the basic understanding is that human, universal human rights are not instinctual, they're not as instinctual as you think they would be. And so the explaining would be something like, um, articulate one of the kind of articles, explain what it means, why it means what it means. Um, I'll jump down because I started with more empathizing with, empathizing with putting them in moral decisions, showing them how the decisions that they're tempted to make actually end up being, if you extrapolate them out, end up being the justification for different mass atrocities over the course of history. And so having them empathize with, oh my gosh, if I took my own decision-making process out to a bigger level, I would, I would you know, commit horrible crimes. See from the point of view of different people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really is. No, it's true. It's shockingly real. Um, and so, no, it really is. There's evil in all of this. So how, do we, how are we aware of it? So kind of more reasoning. Um, Interpret rights by editing one of the articles. So what do you disagree with in the Declaration of Human Rights? Is there anything that you would switch up or change up that you think? Um, so the active interpretation there, or that would be more of application. Um, interpretation would be more like writing a story or telling a tale, I feel like. Um, overcome the naive and biased idea that you're a good person. Um, <laughs> um, but all of this, I think, would come together in something along the lines of I would want them to create a tale or a story in which a main character or character has to make a moral decision that either would violate or kind of be in alignment with one of these basic fundamental rights that they treat people or say you're running a government or say you're doing this and you have to make a decision and then probably write a short introduction or reflection that requires them to tie directly to um, one of the universal human rights and show that the way that they created this tale, they empathize with this character, they, they empathize with somebody who disagrees with them perhaps, actually is reflected uh, in the kind of actual like, an analysis providing evidence from the actual declaration itself. Fantastic. Let's give a round of applause. Great job. Thank you for sharing. All right, let's go to world languages. They, they had a really interesting uh, performance task idea. World languages. Alright, so um, when I looked at all those videos when I was coming here, the uh, it's good to be a kings. I was thinking to myself, how can it be interesting for students to learn about uh, talking about their daily routine? So I thought to myself, why not make it you know a video? It's good to be a kings, but a foreign language. So I figured something that could work for French and Spanish, but um, I specifically obviously talked with Eileen mean, uh, in about the um, the French like a French project for kids. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to actually have our groups collaborate on it. So that way they get the collaboration skill. And then also um, they get to work with the technology, which is also important. Um, and also learn the vocabulary about, you know, your day kings. Um, we have groups that uh, talk about just the academic side and the extracurricular side, so that there's multiple videos. And then we can have some kind of contest, and then we can get Omer and Barra Paul to make it more of like a big thing that is meaningful, not just in class, but to school as well. So what's their overall understanding? The overall understanding would be, there's a lot actually, we came up with a lot of stuff, but the most important thing would be being able to talk about your daily routine. Fantastic. And which um, of those facets of understanding are they demonstrating there again? In the video? Yeah, that may be doing the performance tasks. Applying, interpreting, explaining. Well, I think it would be doing a lot because it's a perspective, like their perspective of like their kings, so they get to show that. And then it's like interpreting, you know, what, what, how they see the day. So there's, I think it's a lot involved. Okay, they're applying it in a real world yeah. setting. They're getting the perspective of someone here. They're interpreting information. They may have to explain it because they're going to have to. And then to also the kind of thinking about like how can I, you know, and then maybe like, the idea would be that maybe there'd be more people that talk French people that come here that want to see that video instead of one in English or in Arabic or whatever. So be, a tool that can be used for other people as well. Fantastic. Good world language. Great job. Thank you. Now, I want to respect your time. I want to show you one other resource that you can use to make sure our performance tasks 
actually allowing students to transfer their understanding. And it's the first page of the handout that we've been working on the last uh, 30 minutes. This is a very simple checklist. And the goal is we want to make sure that whatever students produce gives them the best chance to show understanding, that there's no inaccuracies. And so we want to make sure that they can't accidentally do well by guessing or make, having a good effort, trying really hard, or making it look really pretty. Uh, when I was in high school, my, my senior year, I took a course called Global Studies. It was an honors course. And we talked about all these current issues going on in the world. And the last summative assessment was make a learning product or make a video about what the world's going to be like in 30 years. Well, me and my friends, and some of them are actually in the film industry now, just made a video saying that, you know, uh, California broke off from the United States and became a prison colony, and just this really weird rant of hydrogen cars became popular where every accident caused an atomic explosion. But it wasn't grounded in any actual information. It was really funny, and it was edited really well, but we did no research on this. We didn't present any information or evidence to back up what we were saying. We were just having fun. We got 100%. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got, you got 100% and I learned nothing by doing that. That's what we want to avoid. So when, once you design that performance task, think about, are any of these things happening? Because if they are, if a student can do this, we need to alter the performance task. Or how likely could a student do poorly? How could, could they accidentally do poorly by not meeting the requirements of the task, but still showing understanding. So, you know what? You didn't do the right format that I asked you to do, even though they demonstrate understanding. Okay? Some of those little intricate things on how to present information, even though they're still showing they've mastered it because you didn't do X along with it, your grade is inaccurate in terms of where you were for that learning standard. Or, what if they're showing their understanding but some sort of skill is lacking for them, like they don't know how to use a particular piece of technology, or um, they're using a particular skill that we really didn't go over in class, we know they haven't mastered it, and because of that, that's held them back in their ability to show their understanding. We don't want that to happen as well. So I'm going to show you one more thing that the economics department has recently done to try to create these authentic performance tasks, because it's great for me to say, here's what you do, and then not do it myself. So please hold up the handout that has a little black and white mobile on it. it looks like this. By the way, I do want to thank the Middle School Art Department because we collaborated with the Middle School Art Department to do this. Now, notice at the very top, we actually put the standard they were working on. And this is a small standard. We only need one assessment to do this. Um, this actually only took 45 minutes. So what we said is the standard is to analyze production possibility frontier economic graphs and charts to identify how the role of additional resources, opportunity costs, and trade-offs affect economic output. So this is what we said. In the middle school art department, they were creating these mobiles. And we asked them to, to collect data on how many of the um, pieces a student can cut out and how many of those pieces they can decorate and paint in one class period. <laughs> I apologize. So what we did is we got that data back, and what we had are two particular um, services, or two goods, and we said, here's the data. We need you to make a production possibilities frontier. And so they made this chart with a curve on it based on the data, and we said, assume there's constant opportunity cost. So they actually took that data and used it, uh, created an economic graph based on something real, and then we said, explain what this entire graph means to one student's information, and then explain what are some factors that can make someone more efficient, and then tell that specific art student what they could actually do in their art class to be more efficient, either making those pieces or designing them. Now, if I really wanted to take it further, I could, say, I could actually send the art department all of that information and say you can hand that to the student, here's what they did if you want to do that. But this is a real authentic performance task that took 45 minutes. 
I told them, I don't care how you present this information. You could do it in a written report, you could do it in a, in a typeface, you could do slides, you could do a podcast. You have 45 minutes, choose what's going to work best for you. And what this does is it takes something that's very abstract for economics, production possibility frontiers, and actually puts it in a real world context. If we're looking at the aspects of transfer, it was applying their information. We didn't give them a chart and say fill it out. This looked nothing like we what we practiced in class, although we did prepare them for these skills. They had, it was a new situation that they had to kind of perform. They had to think which of my learning that we've done over the last week actually applies to this situation. And they were doing it autonomously. They weren't doing it in groups. Okay. This is nice. Yeah. Now, if we had a larger performance task, something that talked about supply and demand curves and elasticity and um, dead weight loss and consumer producer optimism, maybe we could make it a week long. But these performance tasks don't need to be multi-week projects. They could be 45 minute little ones. But the goal is that we're getting them to transfer that information. Okay. So, if we look at our objectives, we talked about what transfer is to match their learning standard, what are the characteristics of performance tasks in terms of grasps, how to create some of these summative assessments, which you just did in your discipline specific formats. You've analyzed exemplar summative assessments, the math, the chemistry, the English one, and you've, you've assessed existing summative assessments you're doing when you're creating them. We came around and talked about, okay, what facets of understanding is that doing? What evidence would they show? We talked about how to assess that with that checklist. So, let's say I completely convinced you to start doing this, maybe not right now, because I know we're all busy, but maybe starting in the winter or the spring, you want to start doing this more. So what can you actually do? I don't want to leave you with here are a bunch of great ideas. Here's what you can actually do. Either make an authentic performance task for a future unit that's coming up, because we're all busy, or if you have the time and the will, create an authentic performance task for the next unit that's coming up. Then you can think about how you identify the evidence you need for students to demonstrate it. Does the assessment meet the standards of transfer? Does it pass the checklists that we've all just used in their, these um, graphic organizers? Then once you have it, call me, text me, come find me, and say, hey Scott, can you come and make sure that this performance task allows transfer for the learning standards we're working on in our class? And I will come and I will sit with you and I have a few more resources that can actualize your learning so you can empower yourself instead of letting me be the person that has all the knowledge. I want to give you the power. And then, if you really want to go further with it, I can tell you how some of the day-to-day -day things that you'll do in class can prepare them for those performance tasks, what formative assessments you can do, what day-to-day -day activities you can do, which will hit stage two and show the desired outcomes you had in stage one.